For 19 years during the Cold War, the U.S. Army used human subjects to develop defenses against the threat of biowarfare. We went into a change room, changed into scrubs, went through ultraviolet lights, then went up the elevator to a catwalk. And that's when we walk around the catwalk into these cubicles, where the cubicles were almost like a telephone booth. And that's where you will see us put our head down into this uh, area where they strapped us in so we could not move. And within a few seconds, the exposure was over with. The tests were conducted in such a manner that when the aerosol was generated, each volunteer received a precisely metered dosage of the organism. There were three groups. Uh, one was a control group who just inhaled pure air. Uh, one group was getting a high dose of uh, the infection and another group getting the low dose infection. We didn't know until the end of the project is which one we were on. I was on the high dose. Privates Jones and Tremarchi were volunteers in a study called Project White Coat, sometimes referred to as Operation White Coat. I first heard about this study in 1998 when I was serving as a professor at the National War College in Washington, D.C. I had known that a group of Seventh-day Adventist draftees had volunteered to participate in medical studies for the U.S. Army's biodefense program. But it wasn't until I began research on this film in 2015 that I learned the incredible details of this story. These young men referred to themselves as white coats, and more than 2,300 participated in these medical experiments. This is their story, a story of their commitment to their religious and patriotic duties, a story of their extraordinary courage, and a story of their contributions, contributions, as you will see, that went far beyond biodefense for the U.S. military. Virtually all the white coats were Seventh-day Adventists. They were a special category of conscientious objectors, non-combatant conscientious objectors. Conscientious objector generally is a person who feels that they can't serve in any capacity at all in the military. So they couldn't serve as a medic, they couldn't serve as a cook. They, their conscience says, I can't serve at all. Uh, a non-combatant, on the other hand, says, yes, I can serve with the exception that I don't want to carry a weapon. So there is a distinct difference between a non-combatant and a conscientious objector. While these terms are clearly defined today, the concept of a non-combatant conscientious objector was not always a clearly recognized status for draft boards or the US military. During World War I, the um, Army and the Seventh-day Adventist Church came into some amount of conflict because um, more orthodox Seventh-day Adventists who were drafted into the military wanted to have the ability and the right to keep the Sabbath, and many of them objected to combat arms training and actually being um, uh, armed soldiers in, during the conflict. Uh, because of the Sabbath observance and the resistance to bearing arms, a couple of them were court-martialed. Between World War I and World War II, the church and army leaders reached an agreement so that Seventh-day Adventists could serve in non-combatant roles. However, as with any new policy, there were some implementation challenges. One such case was well documented in the Academy Award-nominated film, Hacksaw Ridge. This film tells the story of Private Desmond Doss, a Seventh-day Adventist who volunteered to serve in World War II as a combat medic. During his training, Doss refused to fire or even carry a rifle. He was called a coward, physically abused and threatened with court-martial. Eventually, he was sent to the Pacific Theater for battle on the island of Okinawa. His unit led the assault on an escarpment known as Hacksaw Ridge and participated in some of the most ferocious fighting of World War II. 
During the battle, DOS rescued 75 wounded American soldiers. While under intense enemy fire, he treated their wounds and carried them, one by one, to positions of safety. Near the end of the battle, DOS finally picked up a rifle, and only to use as a splint for his own arm that had been shattered by Japanese bullets. For his extraordinary actions, Desmond Doss received the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest award for bravery. He was the first conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor. In all U.S. conflicts since World War II, Seventh-day Adventists have served in America's armed forces. Many followed in the footsteps of Desmond Doss, serving as combat medics. However, after World War II, a new military mission emerged for the Seventh-day Adventist. It was a mission essential to the development of defense capabilities against a new type of battlefield threat. The Soviet threat of using infectious disease as a weapon. Throughout most of recorded history, infectious diseases have been the enemy of armies. More soldiers died from infectious diseases than from man-made weapons. That was true in the American Civil War and as recently as World War I, when more U.S. Army soldiers died from influenza than from German bullets, bombs, and bayonets. During the early days of World War II, a new type of biological threat emerged, not from Mother Nature, but from man-made weapons. Unit 731 in the Japanese Imperial Army developed a wide range of biological weapons, crude by today's standards, but used extensively in China and even tested on Allied prisoners of war. In fact, the Japanese planned to attack San Diego, California. Three submarines were to cross the Pacific, surface at night off the California coast, assemble small planes for one-way missions to drop millions of plague-infected fleas on San Diego. This attack was scheduled for September of 1945. Thankfully, the war ended in August. Just a few months before the war ended, the Japanese began testing a new and far more powerful form of biowarfare. This was no longer about putting poisons or deadly pathogens in food and water supplies, or using vectors like fleas and ticks to deliver infectious diseases. In the late spring of 1945, the Japanese began testing the aerosol delivery of deadly pathogens. This was the beginning of modern biowarfare. These aerosols could be spread over large areas. Submarines could release aerosols near coastal cities. Specially designed germ-carrying bombs could be dropped. Enemy agents could contaminate the city water supply. There was great debate inside the Pentagon about this new threat. Some senior officers were concerned about the threat of biological weapons, yet most didn't believe they'd work. And even if they did, there would be little that could be done to control their spread or to defend against them. In 1952, the Armed Forces Medical Policy Council related these concerns to the Army leaders at Fort Detrick and challenged them to produce convincing evidence that humans were vulnerable and that they could be cured or protected from exposure to biological weapons. If not, all funding for biodefense research would cease. This issue was resolved by a test known as CD-22 at Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. We went out in the car, I remember it was a convair, and we flew out there. We were out there for several days waiting for the weather conditions to be exactly what they wanted. And then one night they said, we're, we're on. So they took all of us out into the middle of the Utah desert. And they had stations set up. Each station, there were two chairs for two guys. And there were all sorts of animals, I mean, everything. <laughs> Guinea pigs, rats, mice, monkeys. And we sat there, <clears throat> and then the electricity came on. They said, the electricity's going to come on, and you'll hear pumps sucking in air. And um, it did. We sat there for about a half hour. Didn't smell anything. 
didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. And the electricity went off, they came back and got us and took us back immediately to the airplane. And we were flown back to Walter Reed. We were there just waiting in a hospital ward with blood being drawn three or four times a day and x-rays every day and all sorts of lab stuff. And um, then the guys started getting sick. And I got sick. I know that I, my records say that my fever reached 104. I don't know whether it did or not. I don't remember that, but apparently I did. CD-22 was the only outdoor test involving white coat volunteers, but it convinced senior army leaders that biowarfare was possible and that there was a high priority requirement to develop medical countermeasures and to ensure these countermeasures would be effective, further safety and efficacy testing in human volunteers was essential. In addition, a program for development and testing of drugs and vaccines would require creating an institute with all the resources to do this safely and ethically. There are, of course, many stories about the unethical use of human subjects in U.S. government experiments, including the infamous Tuskegee study by the U.S. Public Health Service that withheld medical treatment from syphilis patients, and the CIA's MKUltra program that gave LSD and other hallucinogens to unsuspecting civilians. The Department of Defense exposed thousands of soldiers to radiation from nuclear detonations. But the most egregious studies involved the Atomic Energy Commission giving breakfast cereals laced with radioactive isotopes to children in state institutions. Many of these abuses were well documented in Dr. Jonathan Marino's book, Undue Risk, Secret State Experiments on Humans. However, Project White Coat was a notable exception. The senior U.S. Army leaders who approved Project White Coat, the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who decided it was appropriate for these young draftees to participate, the scientists, physicians, and medical staff who designed and led these studies at Fort Detrick demonstrated the highest ethical standards. So these days, we're very skeptical, I think, about big institutions and big organizations. Um, but this white coat story is a story about big organization, big institution, uh, a human system that actually did things in a smart way, did it well, uh, and did it ethically. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. The development of these ethical standards began after World War II in 1946. The Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals brought worldwide attention to the horrific details of the medical experiments conducted in the concentration camps. Two American doctors, Andrew Ivey and Leo Alexander, were tasked by the Nuremberg Tribunal to develop a set of ethical standards for any type of medical research involving human subjects. These standards, called the Nuremberg Code, were published in 1946. They wrote 10 conditions that had to be met for human experiments to be permissible. And perhaps most important of these was that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Nearly two years before CD-22, the U.S. Army adopted the Nuremberg Code principles into a directive for ethical research in human subjects. This directive, called CS-385, was published by the Army Chief of Staff on June 30, 1953. CS-385 was the first ethical regulation for the use of human subjects in medical tests ever published by the U.S. government. One of the reasons I love talking about um, the history of human experiments in the military is that uh, people are so amazed when I tell them the story about how the Pentagon is, was the first and only organization in the world to adopt a set of rules for human experiments in 1953. The Army scientists, doctors, and administrators involved with CD-22 were determined to comply 
and the CS385 regulations were strictly enforced through the 19 years of Project White Coat. Once senior military leaders became convinced that biological warfare was an actual battlefield threat, and standards and procedures were in place to begin human testing on biodefense, the Army needed to find a group of volunteers. Representatives from the U.S. Army Medical Corps initiated discussions with national leaders from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Many questions come up about how did the White Coats get started? What was the linkage between the military and the church? Uh, the military, as they were seeing a lot of the Seventh-day Adventist young men being drafted and seeing that they were non-combatants, kind of the light went on. We need somebody that can do these control group kinds of tests. And so the military was the one, they were the ones who came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and offered the option and the possibility. At first, that was not exactly well received because it looked like it was getting a little too tight between the church and the state. But as people looked at it and realized, hey, these young men are being drafted, they are going to serve, what better way to serve than to help save lives, not only on the battlefield as medics, but saving lives in a much wider, broader way. So after quite a bit of negotiation, the Seventh-day Adventist Church leaders said, yes, we can allow this to happen, and we will support that by saying to our members, this is an acceptable way to serve. I was a conscientious objector, meaning a non-combatant, and um, probably because of that, I felt a greater duty to do all I could, although I was reticent to participate in uh, any biological uh, inoculations that might impair my future health. But in the after consideration, I went ahead and did it. The, the presentation to us, I felt then and I felt subsequently, was an honest presentation. They didn't try and pull the wool over our eyes. And I don't know about Merlin, but the fact that we were on a conscientious objector status always made me feel a little nervous. I felt a little, I felt like I could, should contribute more. The White Coat volunteers, I believe, really did get, give consent. Uh, they were, they really understood what the risks were. Uh, they were able to say no, and they were able to drop out. And those are the basic essential criteria for an ethical human experiment. When they came down to present to a group uh, to see if they would want to volunteer for it, they uh, said the project was tularemia, rapid fever. And uh, you know that they've explained the risks of uh, what you are going to be going through and then make a determination do you want to go on this project? You still had the option of opting out, but uh, I decided this is what I came here for and do my duty. We were told that within the first two weeks that we arrived that there would be many different types of projects. They listed some of them. There would be some projects they said that we don't even know about yet because we're still developing stuff. They said, but everything that you would be involved with is preventive, to guard the troops against something that would happen overseas or something that would happen here on the mainland. The use of humans in medical tests and civilian medical research began long before the U.S. Army published its ethical regulations in 1953. In fact, human testing had been around long before there was a United States, but it was often conducted without ethical standards and consent was rarely obtained. Today, Human testing is still a requirement for approval by the FDA for virtually all new vaccines, drugs, and medical devices. Many White Coat volunteers participated in these types of medical tests, including the safety and immunogenicity of 13 important vaccines. However, the truly unique aspect of Project White Coat was the challenge studies. These were the studies that exposed the white coat volunteers to disease-causing agents, pathogens that caused tularemia 
and Q fever, and a toxin called staphylococcal enterotoxin B, also called SEB. They sat us all in place, put a mask on us, and then after a while we could hear the propellers rotating inside the uh, sphere, and I guess they released the, um, the germs or the rickettsial virus, um, and we all breathed it. And then um, when that was over, they took us back to the hospital and waited. And um, some of us got sick and some did not. I probably got started getting sick several days later. I've forgotten the exact number, but it was like getting the flu. The one interesting thing that happened to me was that my gums swelled up so much that I could no longer see my teeth. And that was very strange. I was on the gamma globulin enterotoxin project, which is actually a, a purified derivative of enterotoxin from the staphylococcal organism. And it was terribly incapacitating. Uh, we, we acquired the agent, I'm thinking about eight o'clock in the morning. And by nine o'clock in the morning, I was having violent, violent, GI distress, vomiting, diarrhea. And this went on for probably about eight hours. Then the next study that I was on was the uh, tetracycline therapy for uh, uh, tularemia acquired by aerosol. That was, that was extremely bad. During the 19 years of Project White Coat, there was debate within the intelligence community about the extent of the Soviet Union's biowarfare program. It wasn't until 16 years after White Coat ended that the world learned the shocking details about the massive biowarfare arsenal the Soviets had developed. There had been more than 40,000 scientists and engineers and technicians working in the Soviet Union's biowarfare program. Deadly pathogens that could have created outbreaks of smallpox, plague, tularemia, and anthrax were produced by the ton, a scale virtually beyond imagination. A couple ounces of dry powdered anthrax is enough to attack a large city. And the Soviets produced these pathogens by the ton. U.S. and allied intelligence organizations grossly underestimated the size and scope of the Soviets' bioweapons capabilities. Today, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, we know that the contributions of the White Coats were far more important than we understood during the Cold War. Had the Soviets used their bioweapons against the U.S. or our allies, the knowledge gained from the White Coat studies would have been invaluable for our defense. And not just for the military troops, but even more importantly for our civilian population. The Soviet bioweapons were primarily designed to attack major urban areas, a Cold War strategy known as counter-value targeting. Thankfully, the Soviets didn't use their bioweapons against the U.S. during the Cold War. Today, many intelligence agencies believe the Russians and several other nations, including North Korea, still have bioweapon arsenals, but on a far smaller scale. Today's primary biowarfare threat comes more from terrorist organizations. The biotechnical revolution that's given us dramatic breakthroughs in medicine, agriculture, even industrial manufacturing, has also provided well-funded terrorist organizations the ability to produce sophisticated biological weapons. These weapons would not pose a threat on the scale of the former Soviet program, but nevertheless, they would be in the category of weapons of mass destruction, with the ability to kill as many people as perhaps a small nuclear device. In other words, the knowledge gained from Project White Coat remains critically important today for America's defense. But the story of White Coat contributions does not end with biodefense. These incredible young men made contributions you've not likely heard about, such as their role in NASA's Apollo space program. This Saturn rocket, with the mission designation of Apollo 4, will soon hurl a crewless spacecraft into orbit. What you see here is this country's largest space vehicle, Saturn V similar to the one which will someday carry three astronauts toward the moon. They got a group of us together, and I found out that we were all pilots, except one person. And they said, this is something that's going to be very important to the space program. 
President Kennedy had said that we would send a man to the moon and bring him back in this decade. And we go, we're sending us to the moon? They said, no. What we're gonna do is have five of you at a time into an Apollo simulator. And what we're gonna do is have you run that simulator five to six hours a day, learning everything, all the dials, all the switches, everything, so that you know it. You can do it in your sleep. We had partitions between us. We did not talk. We had Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo, five different individuals. We had a control panel in front of us. Looks similar to maybe a control panel in an airplane. Had a lot of dials, digits, and different things. And we had to function and operate this panel. And so we spent several days just without being sick, doing all these testing and what we had to read gauges. We had to do the mathematical computations. We had to do inner work with the other four people that were in the room with you, which you couldn't see because we're all divided off. We got to where we were very good on the machine so we can control all the functions that we had to do. And then they decided they would inject us with sandfly fever, all five of us. However, one would be a control. And we didn't know who that control would be. So he got a placebo. And needless to say, I was one that did get sick. When they injected us with sandfly fever, they said, you're going to get sick. We want to see if all of you can still function and do everything that's on that panel. They would set us up with emergencies. They would set us up with all kinds of things to see how accurate we were. And my eyes were very sensitive to light. Even the control panel, we had to put little tissue behind the lights because they were too bright and hurt our eyes. And uh, some of us, our joints would hurt. It was hard to walk a little bit. We had to be helped from our bed back to where we were, our living quarters. It didn't matter how sick you were, because they'd wheel you in in a wheelchair with your IV going, because we were pretty sick for a few days. And we started to do these same tests and stuff. We want to see if you can still perform if you're sick, because no astronaut has left Earth orbit. Once you leave Earth orbit, headed for the moon, it's a round trip. And if, they, if all of you got sick, we want to make sure that you can still operate the space capsule. When we first arrived at Camp David, the first thing upon which we agreed was to ask the people of the world to pray that our negotiations would be successful. Those prayers have been answered far beyond any expectations. The vaccine for Rift Valley fever was tested for safety using the White Coat volunteers. There were several tests on the White Coats from 1958 to 1968. Lot six of Rift Valley fever was determined to be safe and then put on the shelf, only to be used to protect scientists who worked with this virus in the laboratory. Many lots have been produced, but only lot six have been tested for safety. In 1977 through 1979, there was a major outbreak of Rift Valley fever in Egypt. Both the Egyptians and Israelis were concerned that this could be biological warfare. The US government was asked to cooperate with Egypt and Israel to assist with epidemiological investigation of the outbreak and provide vaccine. All we had was lot six. Yuzamarid gave all of our lot six vaccine to Israel and Egypt, except 30 vials we kept to immunize our scientists who would be testing the remaining lots for safety in animals and humans. In 1977 and 1978, State Department officers frequently came to Fort Detrick to check on the status of our testing to determine if the U.S. could offer more vaccine to Egypt and Israel. In September 1978, when President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel were meeting with President Jimmy Carter at Camp David on the peace accord, representatives of the Israeli and Egyptian governments were meeting with us at Fort Detrick to arrange additional vaccine shipments. So in 1998, when I was asked to talk to the White Coat reunion about the fruits of their work, I told them that their participation in the Rift Valley fever study at Uzamrud resulted in an outbreak of peace in the Middle East. 
We are privileged to witness tonight a significant achievement in the cause of peace. One of the agreements that President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin are signing tonight is entitled A Framework for Peace in the Middle East. The White Coat story would not be complete without a mention of the men and women, scientists, physicians, nurses, and technicians at Fort Detrick who ran the program. They gave us good informed consent, as it's called today. I don't know what they called it then, but we knew what we were getting into, and they were honest about it. And um, the man in charge of the whole project was a Colonel Taggart, and he seemed to us like he was a straight shooter. I have the highest regard for our uh, commanding officer, Colonel Crozier, at that time, and uh, Colonel Dirks, who was the uh, executive officer, and Major Shamba, who at that time was the director of clinical sciences. And I felt that they ran an extremely ethical program. Colonel Crozier, who I got to know personally, did in fact go through each one of those vaccines, testing them on himself before he ever allowed them to be released out to the other folks, uh, to any of the white code participants. Not only did the leaders of the medical staff at Fort Detrick serve as human subjects in vaccine tests, they also were subjects in the more dangerous challenge studies. In 1965, several of the Fort Detrick laboratory staff who were working with SCB became very ill from an accident in the laboratory. The senior leadership determined that animal and human testing would be required to better understand what happened. But as in other challenge studies, the first human subject tests were not conducted on white coats. After the animal tests had been completed, the first three trials of aerosol exposure to SCB were conducted on volunteers drawn from the senior officers at Uzamrud the commander, the deputy commander, the executive officer, and several of the scientists. Only after the senior leaders had completed the aerosol challenge studies did they allow the white coat volunteers to participate. I know of no better example of military officers leading from the front. Well, I... I would really like to feel, I do feel, that something that we participated in sort of naively has turned out to be of some use to our country and the world. Like and this that. is something that I think we only realized in the last few years, too. Exactly. The contributions of the White Coat volunteers are many. First of all, they helped the U.S. Army develop medical countermeasures against the Soviet threat of biowarfare. They played a role in the Apollo space program, a small role in the Camp David peace accord. But perhaps the greatest contribution of these young Seventh-day Adventists, non-combatant, conscientious objectors, or as they like to say, conscientious cooperators, these courageous young men who wanted to serve their country in a non-combative way, their greatest legacy is the fact that many of the vaccines and therapeutics and much of the knowledge that we have today about infectious diseases was developed during this program. Many of the safety procedures used today in biological laboratories around the world were actually developed at Fort Detrick and USAMRA during Project White Coat. The contributions of White Coat volunteers have saved untold numbers of lives, all of us. Citizens of the United States and citizens of the world owe a great deal to these extraordinary men.